Yeah, well, so I uh, started this, uh, launched it January 1st, um, hooked up with, uh, with Gwen about uh, three, four months ago, and uh, saw we both had uh, the same idea. Gwen didn't have the time. And uh, I said, you know what, why don't we, why don't we find a way to get this done together and get this, uh, get this off, uh, uh, get this off, um, off and started. And so uh, it's been a little over a month and uh, doing well. Well, that's good to hear. And uh, we'll look forward to hearing what you're seeing. Certainly good first month to start a silver venture. <laughs> and, you got that uh, right. Yeah, it's funny. The last time we talked, I think the headline of our talk was, is silver going to be the next Bitcoin? And certainly in terms of conditions facilitating that, uh, a lot right. happened since then. Real quick, before we hop into questions, Yara Vinay of Arcade Economics, welcome on in tonight. Thank you so much, Chris. It's awesome to be here with you guys for uh, Silver Bowl number one. That is right. Welcome. Uh, hopefully we'll score a lot of touchdowns. David, welcome on in. Great to see you back again this weekend. How are you tonight? I'm well, thanks. I'm here outside of Toronto and uh, yeah, looking forward to wh whatever we uh, talk about. Well, I like my friends up in Eastern Toronto right now. We know they're always free. You're not going too far, but <laughs> good time to talk some silver and Andy James Bond Sheckman, welcome on in, sir. How are you tonight? Brother Chris, doing good. Good to see you. Welcome doing to well. Silver Bowl One. And obviously, what kind of Silver Bowl are you going to have without giving away some silver? So Chris has some Britannias here. And Yara, maybe you can keep an eye on the chat for someone who is saying anything silvery. Um, we don't have a ton of time tonight because we actually have an important video coming up at 10.15 Central Time because uh, it's actually something I'm not particularly happy to report in one sense because there's a lot of questions as I continue to look into SLV, especially with the historic amounts that were added last week. And we, can we talked about a little bit on Friday. There was another video Friday that the, the day the Andy Actually, I'll start with you because what I thought was spooky today, I don't know what it means. I just have questions, which we'll see in that show. But the last time that SL, the, the last time it was audited, the day the audited, audit finished was March 6th of last year. Real close to the low. In fact, it was $17.21. And then basically when it opens on Monday, I'll pull up the chart here. It had begun that descent and within two weeks, it was under $12. Now, certainly for those of us who follow the silver market and have seen how paper gets hammered on the market and drives the price lower and I almost have my chart up here. That doesn't really come as a surprise, but that was pretty shocking to me. Here's March 6th. That's the last day of the last time SLV was audited. And then here, which I think a lot of us, certainly I, I'll speak for myself. I'm not, I won't say specific to who, but I believe that a felony took place there in the silver market a clear violation of the law. And there was 388 million ounces in the trust on March 6th, 2020. And in the next two weeks, you had the Fed launch the Sunday night announcement going to quantitative easing. You had the failure of the EFP market. And then the Fed upgraded that, or actually it was the upgrade to unlimited quantitative easing that resulted in the failure of the EFP market. And that amount in the SLV trust has gone from 388 to 704. And nobody has been inside it except for JP Morgan, who a couple months later settled a $920 million settlement. I guess I was told by the leaders, lawyer to phrase it. Andy, does that concern you as someone who runs a business where customers trust you with their medals and you can talk about what is normal for an audit procedure, but what would you say to that? 
Yeah, well, I mean, and you could you could point to the fact that demand was off the charts at that point too. Uh, it's it's I'd say to say the least mildly disconcerting, and uh, I think that was right around the time as well that J.P. Morgan was settling their fine of paying their 180 million or however many ounces that they were supposedly going to pay in uh, in retribution for the problems that they made. I know that they went from a billion to 700 million ounces, or, or excuse me, a hundred. Sorry, from 100 to 130 to what were the numbers, Chris? What were the numbers on Comix at that point? I'm thinking they're they're big picture of a, a billion ounces, but they had what 300 million ounces on Comix went to 130 or 170, something along those lines. Whatever the numbers are, you can correct me. But it happened within days of that too. Whatever it is, that that's just not how markets behave. Markets just don't fall off the table like that when there's just massive demand. Massive demand uh, in in every respect, whether it be physically or or you know globally across the board. David Stein, as someone who's running a business that I personally believe that there are banks illegally affecting the price of what you're selling. What what do you think about when J.P. Morgan issues a sell report? Tuesday at 5 a.m. in the morning, which mentions nothing about the physical buying, mentions nothing about the SLV buying. I mean, does that concern you as a, a, a an investor or as the leader of a silver company, some of these things that you keep seeing? Was that last week? David, that's every week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you can <laughs> pick last week. Because in particular, you know, I know you were on last, last Saturday. We had the big run over the weekend and then, you know, the price got got smashed uh, on Tuesday. That's why I was just wondering if that was a specific uh, event that you were pointing to there. But anyway, to answer your question, um, look, I mean, I, I, I think, uh, you know, in, in, in general, there does seem to be still a lot of negativity uh, coming from the banks about silver, um, you know, and, and how much of that is actually just misunderstanding of the supply and demand uh, or whether or not it's, it's sort of a more uh, coordinated uh, messaging. I don't, I don't know yet, but um you know, I, I was I was pretty I was pretty surprised when we you know we when we had that big run, uh, you know, of about two or three dollars. So it's not not that big, but it was you know it's it was uh, it was pretty uh, uh, pretty important few days um, for us in the silver market, and just the universally negative messaging I was hearing on media about the silver price. Um, so obviously, you know, running a you know a company um in the silver business that's that's discouraging because uh you know we want to be able to sell our product for as high a price as possible you know that's how our shareholders are going to make money that's how we can you know better benefit the communities that we're in uh our workers our employees you know everybody benefits in you know on our side of the business if the price is high so uh, so that, you know, that's, that's what we, that's what we want to see. And that's what we need to think about how we can, how we can achieve that. Peter, any comment on that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> to me, it certainly is fishy. Uh, I mean, you can obviously make the argument that they pulled that trigger after it had run up 20% in a few days. So I would think that would be their argument. But was it overpriced in a very short term, possibly? Historically, fundamentally, definitely not. So, you know, if they, if they have no sort of justification for their sell, then, then that's, that certainly is, to me, questionable. And here you can see the chart, the blue line here. That's where things open last Sunday. Shoots right up. Andy, you've talked all week, uh, and I thought it was important not just to have you on because, yes, we have a business relationship, but that's why I brought other bullion dealers on. There have been several of them on. They've all reported the same thing. People have seen the reports on Zero Hedge and elsewhere. 
So that kind of made a lot of sense that the price would go up, especially when we had record SLV editions that are so big. I have yet to find anyone who believes they're possible. So here's the blue line leads into Monday. We see that rally. And then here's what just didn't seem natural to me. That again, that, you know, how many times we've seen that two o'clock in the morning. And then you actually look over here. Again, this is what just I've seen time and time again. And by the way, for anyone who's uh, watching this, there will be a presentation in 32 minutes that goes through all of this in quite clear detail, lays it out as clearly as possible in a format that I would encourage people to send to the CFTC, send to congressmen, send to regulators. Um, and again, I know there's that a lot of you out there saying, hey, well, what's that going to do? What difference does that make? Gee, if there's ever been a time where it, it, we all would benefit more than ever from abandoning that type of thinking, we, we've seen more attention on this issue than ever. Not that I, if nothing else, just flood the CFTC's in mail, inbox with emails if you feel what we've been presenting here last week or especially what is coming up is relevant because here you see heavy volume right there. So... I guess, David, maybe the question I wanted to ask you before, I would say, based on some of these things, do you feel it's at least appropriate for the CFTC to look at these trading records when we see here in the face of massive, they, they, they claimed 110 million ounces went into SLV over Friday, Monday, and Tuesday. And then here's Tuesday. On Tuesday alone, while this is price is getting clobbered, they reported 61 million ounces going in. David, you're one of the people counted on to provide silver for the world. Does that seem possible to you? And that the price could fall 10% on the day that happens while there is also panic buying in the physical market? No, it doesn't add up, Chris. You know, it's just, it's just that simple. Um, you know, uh, you, you got to wonder how, how SLV adds all that, you know, physical silver so quickly, um, you know, whether or not it was there in a vault somewhere and they just moved the ownership, you know, or, um, but um, yeah, to have that kind of demand and the price going down is, uh, is uh, it's startling. And I might add, I called iShares on Friday. I don't have any interest in reporting anything inaccurate. I don't want to be sued. And I also treat the people in my audience, the, my mom watches. I, I, don't, I treat, they're my friends. So I'm not, you know, all this stuff has been double checked. And I called SLV. I said, you guys say that 110 million ounces went in. Does that mean that, you know, maybe they're going to go in tomorrow or in the next couple of days or anything I'm not guessing here. No, they, she confirmed. If they say shares are added. The metal is deposited that day. And so here's the perfect example. Silver was down 10% on a day where there was panic buying in the physical market and 61 million ounces added to these trusts. And Peter, in a second, I'm going to ask you if you could help put in context for anyone new how much 61 million ounces is. But that's the thing that I, the other question that I would hope the CFTC would ask, is there any conflict of interest? Because if anyone knew that 61 million shares were going into the trust, it's AP Morgan, because iShares also confirmed they're the custodian. And I said, okay, when metals added or subtracted, who actually does that? She says the custodian. And I say, who's that? She says, JP Morgan. They must have known that 54 million ounces went in the previous two days. And then on the day when the market declined 10%, and they gave their sell report right here. They didn't mention, in fact, it's interesting in their sell report, at least the Market Watch article, they didn't mention why they were selling silver. They talked about a whole bunch of other stuff. I'm trying to track down the actual report they issued. I haven't seen it yet. I've heard that they didn't mention much more in there. So who sold up here? Did they have access to the report? This is a little bit earlier. I believe reports issued sometime around here. Has the CFTC checked 
who sold there. People that have access to that report and know it was going to be public before the rest of the world got it. Did they sell there? And Peter, can you put in context? Because I know a lot of people, 61 million ounces, it, it's, how, what, how big is that? Well, uh, a, a, a year's mine supply is about a billion ounces. So if you figure 60 million ounces, I'm going to say roughly a month, maybe just under a month's worth of mine production. So if you figure all the silver mined across the world to be able to add that in a day, that's, that's something. Does it seem possible that <laughs> if the market is not being manipulated, that they could take 61 million ounces, find it somewhere. And actually, Peter, I know you're following this closely. Yeah. Have you heard any bullion dealer describe anything? And I don't, I, I don't think I've ever come on and said panic buying before this past week. Is that right. an appropriate term based on what you have heard? On what, uh, based on what I've heard and seen so far, yeah, absolutely. I've been looking at uh, a bunch of bullion dealers all across this weekend, and um, um, everything, practically every single item's out of stock. I'm talking even in gold. A lot of the gold is out of stock. Uh, they're mostly asking, f you know, for a anywhere from a ten to fifteen day delay special case because of the the situation. And everything I've seen is that. Normally, when prices pop like this, some some supply will come in. People will sell. No one's selling to, back to them. Everyone's just buying or trying to buy. So I, it it certainly <laughs> panic is to me the best disc descriptor for for what's been happening. And uh, yeah, I, I I can't see I can't see any anything else. I really can't. Yara. And by the way, everybody who is joining us now in the live chat, welcome into Silver Bowl One. Hopefully we're making this one a little bit more fun. Uh, we will get some comments about the game from our panelists as well. Um, but before we get to that, sticking with what I think, I think it's kind of great timing because it feels to me, I try to be careful about how it feels like something Super Bowl like is brewing underneath the surface of silver right now. And Yara, you are almost three years into your silver career. Is that about right? That's about right. And Yara works or takes care of all the orders. When people ask us, where do we buy silver? We have a partnership with Andy of Miles Franklin. And Yara, you've been the one talking to people, taking the orders, hearing what they say. I'd love to hear your perspective, what you've seen over this period of time? Well, interestingly, to a certain degree, I have been doing so much Arcadia stuff that I have been having to get help um, back from uh, Miles Franklin headquarters with Andy's lovely wife, Jana, um, helping out because the it was too much for me to do. And um, so it's great that they have an awesome team of salespeople that can help people make the right decisions and get the metals that are best for them. But for me personally, it was too much volume um, to be able mm -hmm. to give people the right kind of customer service. And people were not interested in the premiums. They wanted to get, they wanted to know what we had in stock and what we, they could get delivered soon. And that those were the two first things that were on the top of everybody's mind, whether they were saying this is my first time buying silver or whether they're a person I talk to every two weeks. Very true. Yeah. And you are based on, I mean, you came into this perhaps a little later than the rest of us, but you've seen a lot. You've seen, I think, every video that we've done. <laughs> is there, what, what, what's your view of the, the CFTC's role based on everything you've seen? Well, I'm, I'm not a legal mind in any way, but as a person who has had responsibility for numerous things throughout my life, I, I view it as irresponsible to outright negligence. I mean, we read the mission statement of the CFTC and it's to protect investors. And I, with everything I've learned, I'm having a really hard time seeing how they're living out their mission statement on any level. Especially since 
we heard Bart Shelton confirm that the investigation back 10 years ago, apparently he saw it quite clearly. In fact, the CFTC never publicly mentioned when they said there was no signs of manipulation, they never mentioned any of the things that he found. Right. They could have at least said, we didn't find proof, but there were signs, but they didn't mention that. Now, 10 years later, they found hundreds of thousands. That's actually in their press release. If people think I'm making that, I could understand. Hundreds of thousands. And they said it was over the same time period when they did their first investigation. And yet they've reached a settlement with JP Morgan, but they still, they've said they spoofed, but how is it, do you think as a citizen, it's appropriate that they could comment? Because you heard Bart Chilton and I think people get caught up spoofing, hammering the bid. I think the CFTC calls this a spoof because when I asked Bart about how the mechanic works and I said, I've come to understand that they nudge it a little bit, especially around the handle, those it's like $25, right? In numbers, then you kick the stop orders in, especially it was a day after margins were raised and Bart just sits there and says, yeah, that's exactly how it works. So Yara, based on what you've seen, does it seem like the exact thing that JP Morgan paid a billion dollars to settle, some bank, does it appear as if some bank did that again on the same, right around the same time that JP Morgan told everybody to sell without mentioning any of the rabid demand? Yes, it looks like a carbon copy of numerous other days, although I'll be a little bit bigger than a lot of the other instances we've looked at since I've been a part of this for the last three years, looking back historically and currently. And Yara, you've, you've watched the video that we're about to release tonight and you've yeah. seen some of the things that, and, and you've been there as I've been finding some of these things about SLV in the past couple of days. What are your thoughts on that? leaves a lot of questions unanswered, but with evidence directly in front of our faces is kind of how I was left at the end of the video. And, and throughout our, you know, our journey the last few weeks, as things have gotten wild and things are getting uncovered as well. So I'm, you, I want some answers. Do you think that the investors who just purchased 110 million Shares of SLV in the past week, which I would be, what's that, uh, 250 ish million dollars? Can someone uh, correct my rough, <laughs> rough math there? Do you think they're aware of what is on the video that's about to be released? Very few of them, unless they've been watching your channel the last week or so. It's. Do you it's think that. News. The, do you think those investors, if they had been aware of that, would have purchased 110 million shares of SLV in the past week? I can't speak for other people, but if I had known that and I was going to invest, I would not. And if I was invested, I would get out. Do you think there are some questions that are worthy of CFTC pull, looking at the trading records, especially when you have a fracture of the gold market You've had the SLV thing double and we don't know. I don't know. Maybe the metal's going in there. The JP Morgan lists 193 million ounces on the COMEX report in their house account. Is it, Andy, the, what, how do you feel about that? Someone who's dedicated your life to this industry that these guys pay to settle. They don't never, never speak, never, never, speak for their actions and they have 193 that's almost as much as the total hunt brothers i think it's more than their goal and we don't know if if maybe they took metal from there to put it in slv they're the only ones who know how, how does that leave you feeling as someone who's built your business and also if you could tell people what is your audit procedure what do you do with the last for storage do you handle it some way and and i'm sorry one last question as someone who has a precious metals business, would you be shocked if the person answering the phone at iShares couldn't find an audit? Well, that wouldn't shock me. I think you'd probably have to go through the bureau, you know, the bureaucratic red tape 
you know, process to get to, uh, to someone who could answer that. But I think the lack of transparency is very disconcerting. And I think the question that really needs to be asked is who in their right mind would dump you know, 1.5 billion ounces at the open in a thinly traded session when, when physical demand globally is going through the roof. It's done for effect. And, and that to me is the most troubling thing about all of this is the, it's just very, it's very obvious. This is not how you maximize a sale. You would bleed it out over a series of, of days or, or even weeks at that level. That's a year and a half's worth of mine supplies. So yeah, I find it disconcerting. I think it's, it's a slap in the face of of all of us when uh, they, they pay a fine, admit guilt, and are still allowed to run two of the biggest silver trusts in the world. They should have been stripped of their custodial ship. Uh, they should have nothing to do with uh, integrity and transparency, or, or in this case, lack of running a fund. The fact that it hasn't been audited in almost a year is ridiculous. Uh, as far as our audits are concerned, uh, this is why we use Brinks and, um, you know, we use third party auditing. We have nothing to do with the audit. I just like to go there and oversee it and watch it myself. The custodian should have nothing to do with the audit the, or, or any of the counting. The custodian should only be there to, you know, to, to, to run the mechanics of it. But in terms of auditing and in terms of, of uh, you know, validating in an outflow, that should come from a third party entity. In our case, it's Brinks. When things come in, Brinks validates it. Brinks counts it. Brinks gives us the receipt, sends it to the clients. We don't. And I think that's where the, the conflict of interest is, especially in, in a group like that who's paid billions and billions and billions of dollars in fines over the last 10, 15 years for all sorts of, of financial uh, malfeasance. So yeah, it's, it's, it's troubling. I've said a long time, if all people did who own that fund were to read pages six through 12 titled risk factors and really read it, they'd sell it. There's so many things in there that would lead me or anyone who read it slowly enough, maybe twice to say, what the heck am I doing in this fund? So yeah, I think it's troubling to say the least, but more so, mm. how can anyone explain how any log logical, rational entity would dump that much at the open when the market is going or the demand is going parabolic? It's just so counterintuitive. It's crazy. And Andy, how does it leave you feeling when we had the whole short sale thing? And you hear uh, congressmen, congresswomen saying they're going to raise this investigation. They're going to tell the SEC this and that. Look at who's running the SEC, Gary Gensler, who was presiding over the CFTC's investigation that found nothing. It didn't know to not find nothing that he said found nothing when Bart Shulton told us years later. How, how does that leave you feeling? It's troubling when, you know, the little guy, uh, you know, marches up the hill, coordinated with all of his buddies with their pitchforks and they start winning and then the rules get changed in midstream. That's that's the part that that's troubling. You know, they, they did that to Bunker Hunt in 1980 and, uh, you know, they changed the rules and, and they had to sell their position or they would have gone to jail. So it's troubling. You can see the fact that the the, the little guy never really gets a fair shake and, and when they get close to the finish line, they move the finish line or trip the little guy. And you know, the fact that you're only able to buy one share at the time when people wanted to, 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 to get into uh, GameStop and let it go <laughs> higher, you know, no, you can only own one share. The rules are changing constantly to benefit the, the big guy, the hedge fund, the, the banks. And, and that's not right. That's not right at all. And it, it really, I think, as I've mentioned to you before, I think what we're seeing is the law of unintended consequences. That type of behavior it's alerting people who have nothing to do with metals or cryptocurrencies, people who are in the market and have been forever not looking anywhere else or saying, what the hell is going on here? This isn't how free markets are supposed to work. And I have friends who I know who are telling me they're going to cash. People aren't asking me about gold, don't own cryptocurrencies. They're Joe Sixpack and he's going to cash because you see that it's a rigged game. You see it's a casino. You see it's not fair and it's not, uh, it's not stacked up in our favor. So to me, you know, the silver and gold and all of the things that we talk about, that's one thing. But the law of unintended consequences, I think the more you mess with this, the more obvious you do it and the more obvious it's becoming, I think, uh, mixed in with a tremendous amount of volatility, it will have a, a big impact on people's desire to stay in that rigged game. Don't well, mind. Fortunately, I think it's pretty darn exciting that here at Silver Bowl, Bowl One, the little guy is going to start running up some touchdowns and uh the football in the silver cartels end zone 
Um, which, because again, it's interesting when you think about it, you know, your typical David versus Goliath, even the most seemingly insurmountable mission, well, if you have enough time to plan, you have enough people on your side, and then inherently, if you realize that people who, when faced with a challenge, band together and find creative, positive solutions are inherently smarter, can always be a step ahead than people who have to cheat and use brute force. Well, we'll just come back to that because I have one final question that perhaps David and Peter could take here. Uh, David, perhaps, uh, again, answer this as you will. I know you're running a company, but I've gotten a lot of questions from investors saying, will the miners withhold supply? from the market? Is that something that's feasible? Is that something that comes up? Uh, anything you can comment? And Peter, you as well after David. Sure. Uh, well, every every company is different in terms of what their ability to, to do that would be. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, mining companies have expenses, you know, they have to pay people and they have to you know, make their investments at their mines, etc. So, you know, I, I think if a if a company is is in a very strong free cash flow free cash flow position, then they could withhold metal from the market and you know just uh, you know just delay their sales. Um, I believe First Majestic has has done that in the past. Uh, I do remember Gold Corp doing that in the uh, early two thousands. Um, for similar reasons, but obviously that was gold. And uh, so it can, you know, it can be done. It's pretty, it's pretty unusual because, you know, frankly, uh, you know, uh, at, at this stage, we're just, we're coming out of a bear market. I don't think there are a lot of companies out there that have the, the balance sheet that they can do that. But, you know, I think if they can, you know, some will, and, you know, I think investors would like, may like that. Peter. Yeah. Um, like David said, I know that some companies do do that. Uh, Endeavor Silver is one that uh, I don't know if if they've done it or how much they may have done it lately. But uh, Brad over there uh, did mention that that's something they they can and do do from time to time. Um, I know, like uh, David said, First Majestic um, does that as well from time to time. And uh, to me, it um, it uh, bodes well for. I mean, not only, you know, miners in, in general, silver miners, actual producers, but uh, a lot of, um, you know, sort of uh, near term developers and even your optionality plays someone who's got big resources, resources that are still in the ground. Um, frankly, you know, even as that stays in the ground, as the value goes up, uh, even if it stays unmined for for a while, another year, a couple of years, the value is just going up. So, you know, if it comes out of the ground a couple of years from now, it's going to just generate that much more cash flow. So um, there, are, there are a lot of different types of, of you know, mining uh, or near term or exploration plays that make sense in this kind of market. And uh, in, in any case, that's certainly what we try to, you know, help people uh, find the, the, the right kind of plays, the ones that will do best. Uh, but but this is this is definitely this is definitely silver coming into its own, and uh, it's it's uh, you know it's a, it's been a long time coming, and uh, you know a lot of people also downplay the fact that um, you know maybe you have a bunch of you know you have millions, tens of millions, maybe more of of young new investors who are finally paying attention to this space. Um, I, I wouldn't downplay that too much. I think that it is gonna it is gonna have an impact and a lasting impact, and. Uh, Maybe we're we're going to start seeing silver, you know, really start to catch up um, to to gold and 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 like I say, um, you know, take its place. Janet Yellen is warming up the presses, getting ready to go <laughs> big, so it will be exciting. And again, I mentioned a minute ago how it's been awesome to see. I think I feel like J.P. Morgan, or I feel like some of the banks on Tuesday went all in with a bluff and the beautiful people. I, I think it was awesome seeing how no matter what they threw their little paper junk at, people kept buying. And again, I wish that I hadn't had to do the video that is about to come your way in a couple minutes about SLV. Although I think it's things people should know. And 
you know, maybe the positive that comes out of it. I got one message from someone today saying that he just sold his SLV because of some of the stuff that he's seen and learned. I'd encourage people if what you see in a couple minutes resonates with you, share it with people who are invested in SLV. I would, I would want you to know it. I'm not asking you to agree with what I say, but there's some stuff in there that I would think you'd want to know. And but that's the exciting thing is that once people find out, because how do you ever really change something like that? I don't believe in, you know, taking out guns. That's not my thing or doing anything. And I don't believe in trying to one-up them in their crime, but it's based on a lie. And when people find out, it's like, you know, they don't have, they have to, they need somebody to trade against. They can't pick themselves off. This scheme works on ripping people off and in fact, I just watched the big short yesterday again, and it was perfect because they're like, they make you feel stupid. So you don't ask, so you don't look. And in one phone call in a couple minutes on SLV, there's plenty of red flags there. And I think it's damned awesome that this, I would like to give a big congratulations to everyone in that Wall Street Silver group. I mean, I saw they're taking my videos, taking other videos, they're having discussions on them, saying like, hey, you can, you check this, can you do that? And hey, how can we get this message out? That's inspiring. And it's I like- just got uh, invited on. It, it's like one of those veteran teams where we need that young energy. Cause I see this as being on the ropes and I'm curious what the reaction will be as people see some of this stuff uh, the next hour throughout the week. So either case, uh, folks, can you give a uh, quick, as we wrap up, cause that's about to start in a couple of minutes, just quick uh, where you're from and and what kind of services you offer just so that people know what you're doing and can follow up if they would like to. Andy, can we start with you, please? Yeah, so uh, as always, Chris, I'm, I'm here quite a bit. Miles Franklin, um, you know, a lot of the dealers are out of product. As I've mentioned for the last year, I've gotten in front of all of this and I've gone way out into the future on all of my purchases. <laughs> and we have in total close to 300,000 ounces in Britannia's, Kangaroos, Philharmonic's, Silver Eagle, Silver Maple Leafs, Krugerrands, one ounce rounds and Pam Swiss 100 ounce bars. They are either in my vault or will be within the next week to 10 days. And the crazy thing about it, with the exception of junk silver, all of it is 2021, all of it. There is no backdate material, none. No one is selling us anything. And so I was able to uh, early on and late last year, secure shipments into the first quarter. We're uh, happy to say we will have a lot of stuff to sell over the next couple of weeks. And I uh, always appreciate being here, Chris. I look forward to seeing the show here. I'm going to stick around and watch it. All righty. And David? Uh, well, I uh, run a, a, a silver company called Kuya Silver. So we're developing a Bethania silver mine in Peru. And uh, looking to get that into uh, production, uh, um, possibly uh, by the end of this year, or early next year. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm very, you know, very supportive of, of this, you know, of the silver market and, uh, and, you know, and, uh, you know, doing what we can to be a good, you know, sort of citizen to, uh, to help, you know, uh, the silver price. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's an exciting project, but uh, We'll, uh, you know, so take a look at the website and feel free to follow up if you have any questions. All right. Well, we will do that. And I appreciate that. And Peter, can you let folks know where they can find you? Absolutely. So um, www.silverstockinvestor.com. So uh, I research, write, edit a silver focused, silver exclusively focused investment newsletter. Um, totally independent. We're not paid by any of the companies that we uh, write about. And it covers everything from, um, you know, uh, ETFs all the way to, um, to junior silver explorers. So there's something for everyone there. And um, certainly, um, you know, like I say, we cover the, all the bases, the, the large producers, uh, developers, optionality plays and junior explorers. Silverstockinvestor.com. I encourage everyone to check it out. Yeah, and I will look forward to hearing uh, how you think it's going to play out because it's interesting. Even the next time you have, I mean, there's random days where silver goes up 50 cents or a dollar. I wonder what happens when you have that and then Janet Yellen goes big and then Jerome Powell goes bigger. Um, so I'll look forward to reading that. And Yara, where can people find you and your fine content? 
Well, I am honored and overjoyed to be partners in Arcadia with you, Chris Marcus. And so I get to um, meet with a lot of the people that are on the other end of YouTube. And so I think I'm changing my title from marketing to community um, on some level, because it's really amazing getting to connect with all of the people who watch our videos, who share them, who learn something new, and that sparks them to look into something new. So um, I'm... I'm on Twitter at Yars, Y-A-R-R-S. I, I share all the Arcadia stuff. Um, I'm also, um, it's been really fun getting to work with Miles Franklin and take our orders and get to see kind of the order flow and get my first um, time on the front lines with that. And that's been really fun and I've made some really great friends. And so uh, hopefully I will see all of you at some point on Twitter, on in the live chat, on our videos. And I'd like to invite you all to come to our website, sign up for our uh, newsletter. We don't um, send out anything extra. We just wanna make sure that you're getting all the content that we're making that you'd like to get as every once in a while people get unsubscribed from YouTube. And I'd love to ask you if you're not yet to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that notification bell and share this with your friends and help get the word of silver out there to people who haven't found out yet what changed my life when I found out about it. So I'm very passionate to share that with the rest of you. Well, I appreciate that Yara. And as you can see here, this is the thumbnail of our upcoming video what SLV investors should know about JP Morgan. And I personally feel should send to, or I won't say should send, but I created this. Again, I know it's exciting that we have a lot of these folks in Wall Street, Silver and elsewhere. People, there's a new energy in all of this. And I think these are some questions that CFTC's budget, they requested $304 million that you're all paying for. And I think there's some questions in there that certainly if you have people you care about that are in SLV, I would think they'd want to know. So with that said, we're going to wrap up. You can go over to the channel and find the link. We are going to start the show there. Thank you again to all my guests for being here. And I will see you again soon. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. I think.